I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with us to James chapter 4 and verse 8. One passage of Scripture there as, as we uh, continue on this journey of the irresistible church. We want to be that people that's irresistible to God. Scripture says, draw near to God and He will, He will draw near to you. So some of the questions that we have posed over the last couple of weeks are s- simply these. Are you a draw to God? Is God attracted to you this morning? Does He love just spending time with you, rubbing shoulders with you? Are you impossible for Him to resist? Are you highly appealing? Are you intensely irresistible? And the question on the banner, are you a heart that heaven can't live without? Or doesn't want to live without? Now we know that God loves the world, for God so loved the world that he gave. We understand that love, but yet I just believe that there's a love that's, that goes a step beyond redemptive love. And that's the relational love that God desires to be a part of in your everyday walk with Him. It's His love that brings us to the point of salvation, that redeems us, us, but yet to live life together. We understand that when Jesus was here, that he, He called all, for it's a whosoever gospel, that there's no prejudice in the heart of God, and yet he, He called 12 to Himself. And then he called three to himself. And then there was one called the Beloved that leaned on the, on the chest of the Savior that understood the heartbeat of heaven, John the Beloved. It's a privilege for us to be a part, knowing who we are, where we've come from, the baggage that we carry. And yet there's a stirring in my heart and has always been that I just want to be more than simply appreciative of redemption. I want to have a living, breathing, intimate relationship with this one called Jesus. I want that. I long for that. There's a deep craving in my heart that says I just want to know him. The first trait ever an irresistible church or a people or even a person is simply those that have a hunger for the presence of God. God loves to bless a people that are hungry for Him, that want Him, that He is more than simply fire insurance to them, or he is more than some, simply a healer when they're sick, or a, or a provider when they're in need, but he, he wants to bless those that, that, that hunger and thirst after him. There's a spiritual drive in their heart to pull up close to the master and live in the shadow of his presence. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, they shall be filled. It's all about hunger. Guys, it's all about hunger. It's all about thirst. It's all about your passion and your pursuit of God. You say, well, you know, what about God pursuing me? Hasn't he already? The blood stained at the foot of an old rugged cross is is still moist and still fresh. Yes, He pursued us. And He gave the greatest gift of His heart, His Son. And now it's our turn to say, hey, thank you. And began to chase after God. I've never seen anyone really experience 
A depth in relationship with God without hunger, without thirst, without pursuit, without passion. Redemption is without cost. But relationship will cost you everything. The truth is, true hunger is more than a casual sense of emptiness. But an undeniable craving for more true hunger is an insatiable appetite for the intimate presence of God. How hungry are we this morning? Amen. As you wake up, just say, oh man, I'm so hungry for God today. Is there a spiritual gnawing in your, in your heart and life today because you know that there's much more room that God can fill? Remember, David was a man after God's heart because of, because of the gnawing hunger for an audience with God. Psalms 42, 2, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. I have looked for you. Come on now. You say, well, hasn't he looked for me? Oh, he's been looking for you all the while. The key is, are you looking for him? So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see what? Your power and your glory, your presence, your mercy and your grace. Psalms 143, 6, I spread out my hands to you. My, my soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Amen. I'm telling you, you just don't get in the way of hungry people at, at dinner time and at furs. They will whack you with their cane. They'll run over you with their walker. I'm telling you, when people get hungry, amen, how hungry are we this morning for God, for more of God? Are we just satisfied just to kind of live on the drippings? of revelation or His glory and just get enough to get by. There's got to be something that will will, will turn us on to God, that will stir some divine hunger and thirst up in our heart. And that's my job this morning. That's the job of the Holy Spirit is to move us toward God and create, (laughs) create an appetite for God. That's when miracles show up. That's when salvations take place. That's when glory comes down and fills our soul. It's when the church of Jesus Christ has a hunger and an appetite for the things of God. And we will not be stopped because of the craving that drives us every single day as we pursue the power and the presence of God looking for Him in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and bless Him. That is our heart. That is our heart. As I have shared in past days, you will never walk in it until you want it. We will never walk in at church, Bethesda, until we want it. Poor churches don't even think about the presence of God. Good churches enjoy the presence of God. There's a lot of good churches out there that just enjoy the goodness of God, enjoy the presence of God. But great churches pursue the presence of God. (laughs) I want Bethesda to be a great church. Come on now. A great church. And that is our DNA. Going for God, all of God, now and forever. That's what drives us, motivates us. That's who we are. People that are hungry for the things of God. I want our kids to be hungry for God. But they need to be motivated and they need to be compelled by the hunger and thirst that they see in those lives that have gone before them and parents and grandparents to see tears in your eyes, to see your hands raised, to sense your energy and your passion and your pursuit. Let's encourage and inspire the next generation to move into God because we are living in God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't ask them to do something that you're not willing to do. You lead by example. 
moms and dads. Praise God. So the first trait of an irresistible church, a church that God loves to bless, is a people who have a hunger for the presence of God. Second trait, and I'll take a few minutes, a few, a few minutes is so, so relative, isn't it? Amen. The second trait of an irresistible church, a people that God loves to bless, is a people, now listen to this, a people who remembers who she is. Speaking of the church, a people who remember who she is. One who has embraced their kingdom identity and they live their lives pursuing divine destiny. The pitcher on the coffee canister caught him cold. The man blinked and rubbed his eyes and peered over his grocery card at the image on the taster's choice coffee canister sitting on the store shelf. Well, the sideburns were darker and the lines around the eyes weren't there yet, but it was clearly him. It was clearly him, Russell Christoph, an unassuming 58-year-old kindergarten teacher from Northern California. Christoph picked up the coffee can and showed it to a clerk. Yep, that's you all right, she said. Wow, you're famous. Christoph bought the can and then headed to a lawyer's office. A legal dispute began with the coffee company. It seemed that 16 years earlier, Christoph had been working as a part-time model. They called me, but I was busy. And it posed... <laughs> That was a joke. In case you think I'm serious with my autograph afterwards, that was a joke. Where was I? It seemed 16 years earlier that Christoph had been working as a part-time model and had posed for the picture along with several other models who tried out for the role. Company representatives told Christoph that if his picture was ever used, they would call him back and finalize the contract. But no call ever came. Years went by, and all was forgotten. Then one day, an employee pulled the photo to use in an advertisement, evidently believing consent had been given. The picture was printed and printed and printed and printed. And for six years, it showed up on coffee canisters sold all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, Japan, South Korea, Israel and Kuwait. When the dust settled, a jury concluded that Christoph's picture had been indeed, had indeed helped the company sell coffee, lots of coffee. It had all been done without Christoph's permission. The court awarded Christoph a payment that included more than 5% of the company's profits from the Taster's Choice sales for the years this photo circulated. His award was $15.3 million. What's the moral of the story? It pays to drink coffee. (laughs) No, that is not the answer. What time are we supposed to get out this morning? So people's messing with me up here. What is the moral to this story? It pays to know who you are. It pays to know who you are. Now, granted, we are not a Russell Russell Christoph, a 58-year-old kindergarten teacher from Northern California. Our face is not on the Taster's Choice coffee canister that has encircled the globe. But our face is ever before our God. And our name has been etched eternally in His heart. So who are we? Who are we this morning? 
We are, we are, by definition, by scriptural definition, we are the church of the living God, purchased and paid for by the precious blood of a spotless lamb, eternal in the heavens. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tr tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, I stand before you this morning cleansed and covered and purified by the blood of a precious, spotless, unblemished lamb of God. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. You are a child of God. You are the church of the living God. We are His prized possession. We are His redemptive reward. We are His passionate pursuit. He found us in a desert land, in the howling wilderness. He encircled us. He cared for us. And He kept us as the apple of His eye. We are a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of our God. I'm talking about not only a physical Israel, but a spiritual Israel, the church of Jesus Christ. I've mentioned this before. I believe it bears repeating. We are more than the United Way in all the good they do. We are more than UNICEF. We are more than the Red Cross that we readily and willingly donate to. We are even more than the Samaritan's Purse. We are more than any human organization or entity on the earth that is here today. We are the church of Jesus Christ, eternally founded in the heavens that has no end. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Who are we? Who are you this morning? We are, you are, the irresistible love of His life. For Song of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 10 the writer says, I am my beloved's. I am my beloved's. And his desire, my king, my lord, my savior, my redeemer, and his desire, his love, his affection is for me, is toward me. I just feel like somebody needs to be reminded this morning that, that God is crazy about you this, today. God is absolutely in love with you this morning. He goes on to say in the Song of Solomon 2, verse 4, He brought me to the banqueting house, and His banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head, and His right hand embraces me. The embrace of endearment, the embrace of a lover. That's who we are to God this morning. We are more than just a possession. We are His prized possession today, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can somebody shout amen on Sunday morning? Amen. Glory to God. We are more than a casual acquaintance. We are more than simply buzz, bosom buddies. We are more than just best friends. We are lovers indeed. I am His and He is mine. His banner over me is love. The Scriptures go on to tell us that because of that love affair between man and God, that we are the bride of Christ. We are the wife in waiting. We are betrothed. We are engaged. We are spoken for. We are His eternal future. And there is a wedding that is pending. Hallelujah. Glory on almost show to a Monday. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's who we are. That's who you are, and it pays to know who you are. You're in a relationship that has eternal implications. Glory to God. And yes, it is a profound mystery. Apostle Paul tells us that Christ views the church, listen, Christ views us like a bridegroom views his bride with joyful anticipation, with pure love with boundless hope. 
as I was praying and preparing for the message this morning, I just had flashbacks from almost 42 years ago on July the 7th, 1972, when I stood at the end of the center aisle in Calvary Assembly of God in Lawton, Oklahoma, with my heart pounding out my chest, palms of my hands, they were sweaty. I was a nervous young man. I was very young, out of high school. Kids wait a little longer than the summer after you graduate to get married. Some advice. I was there. It was our wedding day. I think we have maybe a photo, and I looked up. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I mean, as the back doors swung open, the bridal party was all in place. All the flowers, all the candles, all the stuff that you girls live and die for. But guys, we just want a good steak rehearsal dinner. But as those back doors swung open and in stepped my bride, I'm telling you, she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. My heart melted. I was a mess. Tears were flowing. I was like, oh, man, I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. And 42 years later, I still feel that way. But there's coming a day. There's coming a day when the doors are going to swing open. And it's not going to be just any bridegroom. <laughs> it's going to be the bridegroom. Christ Jesus, the righteousness of God. And he's going to be standing at the altar. Awaiting his bride. And I've got this feeling when the doors swing open and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the bride of Christ, we take that first step down the aisle arrayed in the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God. The ring on our finger preparing to be that married one to the Christ that bought us and purchased us in his own blood. I've got a feeling that bridegroom's heart is going to be pounding out of his chest. I believe he's going to melt a little bit like butter. You say, Jesus, the Son of God? Yes, I believe he loves the church that much. If he would use the symbolism of marriage party and the marriage relationship as far as his relationship with the church, do you not think that he has the same feelings except multiplied millions of times over of what we feel for one another as husband and wife? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church, his bride, to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as, just as Christ does the church. It's a mystery. Because we are the members of his body. 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers, I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. In Joshua Harris's book, Why Church Matters, he poses this question. We notice that the Ephesian passage ends with a reference to Genesis chapter 2 which says that in marriage a man and a wife become one flesh. Then Paul tells us that the Genesis passage actually refers to Christ and the church. What is he saying? Now listen. Is it possible that God did not get his inspiration for loving the church from marriage, but that the one reason God created marriage was to illustrate his love for the church? In other words, from the very beginning, God's plan was to show the world His love for the church reflected in the love found in marriage. No wonder Paul calls the metaphor of the church as the bride of Christ a profound mystery. So who are we? We are, we are the bride of Christ. Sit with me. We are the bride of Christ. Make it personal. I am. I am the bride of Christ. Say it again. I am the bride of Christ. Say it one more time. I am the bride of Christ. So you are. And yet sometimes, I'll wrap this up, sometimes we feel like anything but a bride. Anything like eternally betrothed. Anything like divinely chosen. Anything like special. And yet despite all of our missteps, all of our sins, our imperfections, all of our faults, all of our failures, all of our blunders, Is there anybody in the house besides me that's been embarrassed to go back back to God and say, God, would you please forgive me of this one more time? It's almost like I carry it in my pocket because I'm just embarrassed to go back to God and say, God, I messed up again. But in spite of all of our dropping the ball more than ever carrying the ball, Christ love has not dimmed or diminished over time. He is still crazy about us. <laughs> he is still crazy about you this morning. For John Stott writes, On earth she is often in rags and tatters, stained and ugly, despised and persecuted. But one day she will be seen for what she is, nothing less than the bride of Christ, free from spots, wrinkles or any disfigurement, holy and without blemish, beautiful and glorious. It is to this constructive end that Christ has been working and is continuing to work. The bride does not make herself presentable. It is the bridegroom who labors to beautify her in order to present her to himself. Paul said that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Just as, listen, and I, and I bring this to a close with this scripture, just as God chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And in him, this is Christ working on us, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purchased in himself. You may be sitting here thinking, you know, I, I, I can be forgiven, you know, I, I can sing the song and, I can have a devotion, but I don't see that I could ever be 
the bride, the bride that Christ is coming for and the bride that Christ deserves. How many here you feel much less than an unblemished, unspotted, unsoiled, unspoiled bride? Is there anybody here that God still needs to do some work on you? Let me see your hand, okay? Testify. (laughs) Yes, Revelation talks about the bride making herself ready and how that we are to have an undivided heart of love for Christ, uncompromised eyes, unsoiled hands, an arguable devotion that we have. That's our job is to love him, to love him, to love him, do our best to keep our act in order, keep our hands clean, our heart pure. That's our job. But there's nothing that we can do. Listen, there's nothing that you can do to make yourself good enough and clean enough to qualify to be his bride. It's only through the forgiveness of sins and his shed blood and his grace and his mercy and his compassion toward all of us. It was on this very platform several years ago that we were involved in in a beautiful wedding. I told my wife after counseling, the premarital counseling, I said, I've never counseled a more mature couple have their head on right and have all their ducks in a row and they were working on their master's degree at OU. They both had music degrees and very talented kids. They both were from out of state. Family had flown in. They had a stringed quartet in full tux from OU from their music department. Songs were in Latin, I suppose, either that or in other tongues. <laughs> I didn't understand them. I was to be impressed. I was supposed to be impressed. I... Everything was going very good, getting everything ready. And right before the wedding, say 10 minutes or so before the wedding actually started, the bridegroom came and he said, Pastor, you need to talk to her. He said, I think she's getting cold feet. So I sent a message back to the bridal area, and the message came back. She's fine, just a little, just some nerves. She'll be okay. So we began the wedding. Everything went off beautifully. Everybody in place. We're here. The couple's before us. We start into the vows. He does great. We get to her. Repeat after me give her a line, and she kind of stumbles through the first part, and then she whispers to me, I can't do this, in which I said, yes, you can. (laughs) So we go into the next line. She hesitantly says and repeats this line after me, and on the heels of that, she again says, I said, I can't. And I, in turn, said, oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. So we got this little under-the-radar dialogue going on here. And so about three-fourths of the way through the vows, she finally says, I can't do this. And she reaches up and takes her, her veil, and she throws it on the ground. <laughs> and I said, Whoops. And the bridegroom looks at me, and the whole party was looking at me like, what do you do now? And I said, uh, if you'll excuse us for a few moments, we're going to exit and go to the fellowship hall. And so I took the bridal party back to the fellowship hall. She was not interested at all in going back and completing the ceremony. And finally, the question was asked of the groom, well, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I don't know. He was kind of a nervous young man. He said, I don't know. I would hope she'd make up her mind pretty soon because I'm pretty hungry, and that chocolate cake over there looks really, really good. 
Is that not such a man thing? I wish I could tell you there was a fairy tale ending to the wedding, but there wasn't. She was done. So I had to come back and I had to announce to a pretty full house, almost like today, I said, hey, they decided to um, postpone the wedding. If you brought any wedding gifts, if you'll take them and as you leave and just pray for the couple. And it was like a funeral. People started to cry. You hear people moaning. It's like, oh, man. So the next day after church, we were sitting at dinner at our home with our kids there. And we received a call from her dad. Her dad was a, was a Nazarene preacher. And he said, just thought I'd give you a heads up. He said, the, the kids... Uh, got married this morning (laughs) said she had just heard so much about what was required of her as a wife she's a very timid girl and said she just freaked out one of her best friends called her that just been married six months and just told her said it's horrible (laughs) and so we talked her off the edge of the cliff and said we went to a little building in some addition, a little clubhouse, and we married them this morning, and they're headed toward Dallas. They've got a cruise planned. And today, I can tell you that they are happily married, and they have two children, and they're both teaching at a university in Indiana, in Indianapolis. I said all that to say this. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can do it. And he'll help you. He'll help you live for God. He'll help you on those days when he feels a million miles away. He'll help you when you get the doctor's report and they say there's nothing else we can do. They'll help you when he says or she says, I'm no longer in love with you anymore. He'll help you when your child becomes a prodigal. He'll help you. He'll help you every day of your life because you belong to him. You are more than just an asset to heaven, someone to populate the glory land. You are the bride of Christ. And yes, you can. You can make it. You can do this. It's important that you do because he's coming very soon. And I can almost hear wedding bells ringing So I ask you, are you getting ready for a wedding? Because it's almost upon us. (laughs) He's polishing his shoes. He's being fitted for his tux. And the bride, the bride is making herself ready. (laughs) We're getting ready for a wedding. A wedding of all the ages. As he presents to himself, he presents to his father a, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, covered by the blood of Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, thank you today for the power of your word, the power of your spirit. (laughs) Thank you that you love us so much, God, that we can't even begin to comprehend or understand the height, the depth, the width, the breath of your love, O oh God. And I pray this morning, Lord, if there are those in this building that says, I just, I don't know if I can do this Christianity thing. I, I don't know if I can live for God. I, I don't know if I have what it takes. God, will you just speak to their hearts this morning and just remind them It's not about them. It's about you in them. It's about your grace in their failures. It's about your forgiveness in their faults. It's about your mercy when they mess up. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's what makes a bride worth waiting on. 
thank you, Lord, that we are more than simply divine notches on your gun, trophies on your mantle, but we are the nearest and dearest thing to your heart. And you are crazy about your church. You're crazy about your bride this morning. Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise the Lord.